How many of you here own a car? Can you raise your hands? That's awesome. And how many of you have actually seen a check engine light on your car? That's great. <laughs> so for others who don't know what's a check engine light is actually the vehicle's uh, diagnostic system that actually tells you what's really happening with your car, right? Uh, and now another question where how many of you would take your car to a mechanic as soon as you see that light? Check engine light on your car. I don't see much hands raising up, but it's fine. <laughs> uh, so imagine if you could, if I say that there is a technology that actually could act as a check engine light for your body. Sounds amazing, right? But the sad reality is not a lot of people will take action, okay? There are signs, a lot of signs and symptoms associated with our health, but then people choose to ignore, right, all these different signs. So it can be as simple as pain or fatigue, sleeplessness, uh, and as complex as getting a chest pain, right? Fundamentally, there's like two problems in healthcare today. One, access to the healthcare data or information, or getting the data, right data, at the right time in the right manner. That's, that's what is one main challenge. The other one is behavior related, right? Even if you're presented with all these amazing information, what are you doing to act upon it? Nobody does. A Not a lot of people do a lot of things. So that's part of the behavior aspect of it, right? So, and it, it's a longstanding problem in healthcare. Essentially, like I, I spent like around 15 years working at the Johns Hopkins. I went around pretty much every single room within Hopkins where uh, I've seen doctors always complaining, oh, my patients don't like take their pills. My patients are really non-compliant, non-adherent. I thought it was all like, okay, I, mean, I don't know what's the problem. I mean, nobody is a patient, right? Until you get into that situation. So that was always the thing, but it's really challenging, right? Because all these behavioral issues, it was like manifesting into chronic conditions like obesity, heart diseases, lung diseases, and various forms of cancer. These are all directly correlating to actually your behavior and your lifestyle decisions. So when it comes to like taking care of your health, right? <laughs> or eating, like we always tend to eat like what we find quickly. Like our minds are so much wired into eating the kind of things that are fatty, something sugary and salty. That's, that's guilty pleasure, right? From everyone. And while others still wanted to get that kind of a six pack, but they really wanted to relax in their uh, couches, watch their TV. And how many of you have been in this situation where you wanted to avoid the last glass of wine or alcohol, but you chose not to do it, right? While others keep binge watching <laughs> like our favorite shows on Netflix and find it very difficult to actually really sleep, right? So sleeping is a main problem. So I find it very surprising and, and difficult for me to understand like why we are taking less care of our, our most precious thing in our life, our body, right? So if you know, there are more than half of US population have at least one chronic condition that requires regular monitoring of their health. And with all the advancements in research and technology, seven in 10 Americans could die from a chronic condition that is associated with lifestyle related risk, right? So, and it's costing over 40 trillion, like with a T, for managing all these patients. It's really hard. I mean, healthcare is hard in the US and we all know that and we all have experienced at least once in our lifetime, right? So I'm really very passionate. Like I'm passionate about making the change in healthcare and then help ensuring that the patients and not their conditions that are controlling their life, right? So it all started with my mom. Uh, almost 15 years ago, when my mom was first diagnosed with diabetes, I felt like, yeah, I mean, everybody has diabetes. That's the kind of mindset we have, right? Then she started getting into a condition like I mean, hypertension. Again, that's also another problem. We think like, okay, we have it. It's not a problem. But then that actually went into chronic kidney disease. I don't know if you guys know, but almost nine out of 10 people with chronic kidney disease don't even know that they have the condition. And the usual sus suspects are basically people with diabetes and hypertension. I feel super disappointed when I knew about it because I spent like 15 years in this healthcare before that when I knew about it and I ignored that. And, and as a son, I just ignored that. And I felt like very guilty at that point of time. And I was thinking like, what if, I, I mean, and today it's even worse, right? 
So she is on a fluid restricted diet and salt restricted diet. So, and she gets hospitalized way too often. And it's super difficult to find what's the reason behind it. And as a caregiver, I find like very brutal to actually give like every, like count every drop of water, every gram of salt that goes into our diet. So it actually not only affects her quality of life, it affects my quality of life and, and my way of living it. Basically, that, that's what is it. I mean, the conditions, once it gets to that point, it's going to be very, very difficult to manage at that point in time. And I always wish, like, what if I have more or less like a check engine light uh, for your body, right? Something that I could use to measure our health every single day, something that I can actually help find what's really happening with our health at a very early stage so that I could have predicted or prevented those comorbidities that she has today. I could have changed the trajectory of her health, but it was not possible. Right now, we can still make some difference. We can still make a difference. Especially if it's your mom, it's, it makes it even more difficult to actually deal with it, right? So we all would have had that check engine light moment in our lives, which would have helped us to, like, again, awakening our inner health consciousness and made us feel a little bit better about our health. Um, I had that moment several times in my life, and which is what actually inspires me, fuels my energy to become an entrepreneur to build a technology that is actually could revolutionize healthcare and help millions of patients like my mom to change the trajectory of their life and take control of their life. I mean, it sounds like very <laughs> simple, but I think uh, getting control of your life is, is, is very important. And that's why we need tools and technologies to do that, right? So when it, when it comes to really like today, um, patients don't get any condition management, but just catastrophic support, Okay. And over 50% of physicians still use inefficient, error-prone single indicators like a scale, wing scale, uh, or less specific wearable devices. We all have Apple Watches and other things. Some are validated, some are not. Um, so whereas like, they expect the patients to self-report their health status, that's also is a challenge. Because the healthcare system makes everyone, like disempowers everyone. That's the word I was looking for. It disempowers everyone, make them feel really bad about their situation and also help them to like at least indirectly contribute to a decline in their health, right? We, we need to do something better. We need to help them out to move into the next phase. So what we really need is to collect a lot of health information rapidly. So we need, we need to collect a lot of vital health information every single day from an individual so that they can make meaningful differences in their life and also understand like what's happening in a more holistic manner, right? There's a lot of different technologies that are available today, like from, I mean, from lab tests, MRI, CT scans, you have like a point of care technology solutions. There's, um, there's like lab tests that does also that, and also wearable devices have played a lot of role. Those are all great. But when you come to diseases, I think in the past three years, we, we understood like how like our COVID actually changed, right? There's different variants, different variants had different symptoms or symptomology. Similarly, diseases have different symptoms, and it's so difficult to identify those unique values. So we need specific technologies that are far more advanced to measure those things at a very early stage, right? So researchers have found like breath and saliva has been uh, like mouth, first of all, firstly. Mouth is a great source to collect key health information because of the access to breath and saliva. Because breath and saliva is considered as a mirror of the body, and it's also a medium that is like virtually non-depletable, and it's easy accessible, and it also offers tremendous potential for a lot of different medical analysis. Like, and, and there are like small amount of compounds that are there within each of our breath and saliva that if we've captured easily, it could actually predict an adverse event, predict a condition at a very early stage. There's a lot of sensors there. I mean, as simple as like sensors like carbon monoxide, which actually measures uh, like oxidative stress or it measures smoking cessation in certain cases. There's also uh, carbon dioxide that measures um, uh, your metabolism. And there's a lot of other things that can also lead to predicting uh, cancer in a lot of different cases. These are some of the conditions that can be predicted using breath and saliva and many, many, many more. So there are companies that actually use these technologies. So today you can go, certain technologies, not a lot of there, uh, you can go to a facility and then collect, provide your samples and then they collect the information and make the processing of this data for you. But it's again, you have to go to the hospital, you have to go do other things at the hospital uh, and then the data doesn't come instantly, it takes some time. 
Uh, it's also, you need some training and assistance. While others have taken a step further in terms of actually doing a little bit more, for example, like sensors like this, you can breathe into it, uh, it measures, and then also like devices like this, you can actually breathe into this device to measure not just metabolism or behavior, but overall health. It measures your behavior. It just ties back. So for example, parameters like heart rate variability actually tells you, are you stressed? Do you have any anxiety? So if I start using one of those devices, you might see like <laughs> different waveforms because I'm kind of like nervous here, right? So all these technologies and all those things can be super helpful. We can provide all these different information. First, the challenge, as I said, like we don't have the data. Once we have the data, the next major thing is to really understand the behavior, right? Because that's the root cause of a lot of different chronic conditions. Finally, the crux of it comes down to actually decision making. When you present somebody with the right amount of information about their health, they tend to actually help to change their behavior. So behave, personal health information works. So like especially with, with changing behavior, for example, I'm going to really talk about a simple example where if a person is provided with their health information in a more relevant manner that ties back into their lives, okay, in, in some way or the other, and, and, and in a more, like, I would say, not in a fearful way. Like, I mean, I'm sure we have seen, like, uh, cigarette ads with uh, cancer patients' uh, photos in there to just fear that fear, but I don't think it ever worked in any case. People still smoke. So this should be done in a more, like, direct manner that is relevant to their lives. And then those relevant data should actually ties back to some of the options or choices or direction in which they can go, right? And then those directions should be immediately tied back to like a plan of action. And that plan of action, again, creates more information that creates a feedback loop. It sounds like a real concept, but it really works. I mean, let me tell you an example, right? So I'm sure more of, most of you have seen this. Because of copyrights, I couldn't find other pictures, but I'm sure everybody would have seen when you're driving, right? Here is your um, speed limit, and here is the limit, and then here is your speed. So I'm sure most of us would have stopped for a second, or at least like slow down a little bit. Uh, it's, it's a behavior. We just think like, oh, I'm doing something that is not right, right? But that's the personal information that we are giving. So researchers at the Morgan State University, actually, they conducted a study where they put these signs in different places and try to figure out what really happening with these situations. And what they found was very remarkable, right? Lot, almost like 90% of the drivers stopped or slowed down by like at least 10 or 15 miles when, when they saw this sign. And more importantly, they also like slowed down even further, like for almost like five miles or something, they were maintaining the same thing. Which is, which is great. <laughs> I think maybe next time you guys should really try it and see what's happening in the neighboring cars. So this was a great experiment. So I just wanted to put it in, in context, in simple examples, so that we understand. Because again, parallelly, I want to tie back to healthcare, right? So let's say uh, one of the, one of the person from the study or a group of people from the study, like they were driving and then um, the actual speed limit was 50, but then they were actually... Uh, sorry, 30, but they were actually driving in 50, at least 20 miles more. And as soon as they saw that, from their perspective, the relevance is they are going fast. That's, that's the thing that we're providing them. They, especially those cars are going faster. So for them, the, the, the options are like either continue to go fast or slow down. But the action, what they chose to take, everybody, pretty much most of them actually chose to slow down and then like follow the rules and then go in a direction where they were able to do it immediately. And that was very helpful for them to at least continue to go further. So now I'm gonna tie it back to a simple example, or at least like an example like everybody knows, especially when it comes to smoking, right? A lot, a lot, I'm sure some of our friends would smoke or we know, we definitely know that one person in our lives who smokes, so it's gonna be relevant. So what we could do when it comes to help is like, for, to help with smoking, cessation, other things, we can present technologies or devices that measures personal data. Those personal data that actually tells you about your heart functions, lung functions, your lung age, heart age, those are things that can be calculated. From there, you actually provide them the relevance to their lives, essentially telling them, okay, here's your health, here's your vitals, here's your lung functions. And then connect back to like giving options, either going for a smoking cessation program or basically not ignoring it. 
immediately, the immediate action is quitting smoking. That action actually feeds into provide a more positive impact on their lives. So they start creating that meaningful change, which helps them to see the positive health impacts of all these different vitals on their health. So they continue with their trajectory without quitting smoking. There are a lot of technologies that are out there that are actually simplifying these data information. They are taking a multi-sensor biomarker approach, more like a fingerprint approach to provide a unique signature about an individual's health. With the power of data and data science, like healthcare systems are taking far more importance to patient health and presenting it in a way that is more digestible. Everybody should understand the data. So for my mom, she gets information as like red, green, yellow. That's good enough for her. She knows what range she needs to be in. Well, for others, it's a different story. All these different technologies are pushing things like healthcare outside the, the normal boundaries of our healthcare system, right? I'm sure most of you would have probably had a telehealth visit or, or like seen a doctor remotely. That's going to be the new normal. I mean, we're going to have a lot more like patients coming to our place, clinical trials conducted at our homes. Like there's going to be labs that are done in our facilities. So what it does is like all these things are great, but again, it ties back to the behavior, right? I mean, if, if we can change the behavior, we can engage more. Engagement is not just like compliance, right? We hear about the term compliance. Engagement is more about involving in your care, engaging in your activity, making sure that you're doing the right things at the right time. So in order to achieve that kind of involvement, because engagement is the blockbuster drug of the 21st century. So you're moving, you're moving faster. So human behavior has shown that it's been an ultimate channel for all drug development efforts and everything. So uh, <laughs> after this amazing uh, like musical performance, I don't want it to really be preachy, but actually what, what this real talk, what I really wanted to convey, some of the key takeaway points is like really focusing on the big picture understanding your overall health, and then break down that big picture into small goals. Let's do that from today, right? And then help improve our self-efficacy. Once we improve that, our behavior is going to change. Once we change that behavior, let's make it sustainable. Today, we are changing the culture of healthcare monitoring. And I hope every single one of you takes some value from this and just be the catalyst of your own health and life, right? Thank you again for the opportunity.